Welcome back to another episode of the Salty Nerd Podcast. I am your host, the Salty Nerd. In today's episode, we're going to be discussing big budget box office bombs, the movies that just couldn't cut it and spent too much money making it. I am joined, as always, by my illustrious co-host, starting with the barbarian himself, Matt Vader. What's up, dude? I don't know. <laughs> All right. Not the, bu- not the box office numbers for these movies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's definitely not up. Also joined, uh, joining us today is our ambassador of estrogen, <laughs> Jude. Welcome. Hi. How's it going? I'm good. How are you? Not, the coffee hasn't kicked in yet. <laughs> All right. I'll catch up. Hold on. <clears throat> also joining us today is the author extraordinaire, Matthew Kadish. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. And, uh, just before we get started, I just wanted Thanks to... Thanks for inviting him into his living room. Yes. Yeah. It's very nice. In my own studio. It's very nice of you. <laughs> You're very gracious to have me <laughs> every week. It's, I'm just the name. That's all. You're, so, you're the marketing. I'm just the name. Not you're, even that. You're the, you're the Vince Neal. You're, you're our front man. <laughs> all right. It's kind of true, right? I'm all right you know. with that. Can I be uh, Nikki Six? Yes. Sweet. We're going to go back in time and replace you with Lou, though. <laughs> <laughs> Motley, no, I, Motley Lou. I wouldn't blame you. Uh, before we get started, I want to remind everybody that you guys can support the podcast. Go to saltynerdclub.com. That takes you to our Patreon page. We have several different tiers that you can choose from that have uh, some great uh, benefits. You can get some stickers. You can get some t-shirts. You can get some exclusive content. We're talking full-on episode podcasts that are only available to exclusive Patreon members. I mean, those are the best ones. Those that we are do. my favorite ones that we do. They're I like really cut loose in those. Yeah, you do. So <laughs> yeah, if you want to get, we don't like, censor ourselves for the patrons. Yeah, no. I'm 100 percent censored for if these you, if normal you shows. If you pay for our content, you get like unsigned stuff. Yeah, you get the good stuff. <laughs> yeah, you, get the good stuff. <laughs> you get the full Vader experience. Right? <laughs> Jude uses her smoky voice. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that's saltynerdclub.com. Go support the podcast. Help us grow our channel and join the community. All right, we're talking. Big budget box office Big bombs. Big budget bombs. Starting with the action reimagining of space <laughs> opera, whatever. <laughs> he almost made me. He almost made my coffee shoot yeah, out the, of my nose. The, the, the Channing Tatum attached <laughs> action reimagining of yeah, he's actually, the Wizard of Oz. The Wizard of Oz. Yeah. Yeah. And, he actually, and was attached to this movie. He was. So, yeah. um, so anyway, Jude, why don't you tell us about this movie? Why don't you tell us uh, how much this movie bombed by, and what were the consequences of that? Okay. So, uh, Jupiter Ascending, uh, 2015. I'll give you the synopsis first. A young woman discovers her destiny as an heiress of intergalactic nobility and must fight to protect the inhabitants of Earth from an ancient and destructive industry. So, I'll tell you what the budget was, and then I want you to guess how much they made. Okay, so the budget was... 176 million plus marketing costs. And I think they had to do a bunch of reshoots, didn't they? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Do you want to round that number up? So roughly 200 million. Okay. $200 million budget. Mm-hmm. And how much did it make? I'm going to guess under 100 million. No. No, you are incorrect. It's more than 100 million? Mila Kunis, Channing Tatum. People okay. went to see this movie. Okay. Well, I guessed wrong. So go next. Okay. $107,500. <laughs> <laughs> the price is right. Yes. And One dollar, Bob. I know Kadish already knows what it grossed. Did you have a guess prior to looking it up? Um, well, you had told me while we were watching the movie uh, how much it made. So. Okay. What did. Okay, fine. <laughs> <laughs> so, how much it, did it make? It grossed $183 million. So, it lost $87 million. Okay. It's not as bad as I thought. But still, those are some yeah. solid solo numbers. Yeah, yeah. It, <laughs> so. it was beaten its opening weekend by the movie SpongeBob. Ow! Yeah, well, it's, come on, it's SpongeBob. <laughs> it's SpongeBob. Not just Sponge, the SpongeBob movie, Sponge Out of Water. So it was the <laughs> awesome. sequel to the SpongeBob. Oh, it was a movie. sequel. Is that the live action one that. with people in it? Yeah, I, I believe it had Keanu Reeves. There's in a it. live action SpongeBob movie. It wasn't live well, action. It had like live action elements. When they to it. when they got out of the water, it was an action reimagining with Keanu Reeves attached to it. <laughs> Okay. Anyway, Jupiter ascending. Uh, so it was the uh, it was the Wachowskis' third big budget flop in a row. The other two being Speed Racer and Cloud Atlas. It got nominated for six Golden Raspberry Awards, including Worst Picture, Worst <laughs> Actor, Worst Actress, Worst Supporting Actor, Worst Director, <laughs> Worst Screenplay, uh, and Eddie Red 
Redmayne won for worst supporting actor. He always talks like this. <laughs> That's exactly uh, right. How dare his you? His whispers throughout this entire movie drove me crazy. My family has run this galaxy <laughs> from the start. And then he'll just randomly yell. Yeah. He's like the best character in the movie. He was, was the best character. In the movie. <laughs> <laughs> it's not saying much about the movie, but you're right. Yeah. He was the most well, dedicated he, to he, his craft. He's award-winning actor Eddie Redmayne. Right. <laughs> Who is he in Harry Potter? Oh, uh, he was a uh, Newt, Newt Salamander. In, yeah, in so the, uh, he's not in Harry Potter. He's, he's in, the main character of the yeah, the beast, yeah. of the fantastic. That's the same dude. Yeah. Of the Fantastic yeah. Beasts. Yeah, he was also Newt's in uh, the Aeronauts with um, what's her name? And, from, and I didn't. Man, he like really is different. In, yeah, yeah. He well, like, he's got, have he, you seen him in the Dutch Girl? It looks like he has <laughs> cotton balls stuck in his lips. Yeah, his it's crazy. Constantly like this. He's got very collagen lips. Collagen. I almost thought it was a voice actor doing him. Like over, overdubbed. Yeah. No, it was, that was like him. he was trying to do Brando. Oh, oh, this this movie, though. Yeah, terrible version of it, though. Yeah, I was like actually, a bad Brando. Yeah. Like a skinny Brando. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to make him an offer. He cannot refuse. <laughs> my child's wedding. <laughs> I don't know. I kind of like this movie. But, Are yeah. you serious? It's parts of it. Tell me about it. What did you like? Um, I, I liked, you know, I'm a very visual guy. Right. The special effects in this movie were killer. They were really good. Okay. Um, Imaginative. Um, but I think the thing I like most about this movie is just the different, the different aliens and the different species and stuff. Ugh. Yeah, I, I, I do. I <laughs> Sorry. just like, <laughs> but, but they were like, really, they seemed really out of place to me. Like, like the dragon dudes, they look like something like straight out of like a dragon lance, what a dragon lance movie yeah. should be. If you guys are familiar with that at all, there's no, a, it's a, dun- it's a Dungeons and Dragons world. Okay. That's, in, that's in populated there's lizard by, people. There's, well, they're dragons, dragon people and they're, they're called dragon kin. Okay. And they're just like that. Like r- that's right out of the book. They look exactly like that. Guys, mm. Those guys, but I, I'll but, give them uh, points for creativity. Yeah. There's no yeah. lack of that. Well, it was weird. They had a lot of weird stuff they, in this movie, but they kind of based all the aliens on like human animal hybrids. Mm-hmm. And so yeah. like some of the aliens just had a very weird design. Like there was that, uh, that half, half elephant guy. Yeah. yeah. Like that the was ship. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and like, that was just like weird. And, and then, he was like, like Trumpeting when he was yeah. flying, <laughs> and, was and, and then there was the the huge ears on like that that one species. Yeah, like, that one girl. Yeah, it was just like she they was just, like they looked so goofy. Yeah, you know, like it was hard to take the the show. Like I understood what they were going for, but it was hard to take it seriously because the aliens just didn't look cool it, to mm-hmm. me. Yeah, it had they looked goofy. I got kind of like a um, Fifth Element vibe yeah. from it. Well, that, I th- I think the fifth element was definitely an influence. Well, on this film. Yeah, yeah. It just um, I don't know, man. The, it, it all looked weird, but it was but the effects were done well. But they I mean, did, but they looked weird. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Even, even the spaceships, like yeah. they designed the spaceships around different animals or insects, depending on the spaceship. Right. But they had like these weird things where like they were just kind not of floating. A, not everything was attached to the yeah. spaceship. Like they had mm-hmm. wings, but that, they were like held together with like force fields. Yeah, like <laughs> something weird, and and they would like. Shape shift and do like weird stuff. I like I like the, the whole the whole folding space, the the the, the light speed mm. effects and stuff. But you know, CGI, fancy CGI in today's movies isn't that big of a deal. I At mean, the time, what year did this come out, Jude? Uh, 2015. 2015. It's not that long. Okay, ago. It's not that long ago. Yeah. Wow, feels like it's been longer. Well, they yeah. started shooting it, I believe, in 2013 or 2012. One of those two. Like it was a very long production. Like they spent. I think six to eight months just doing like kind of previs work, like working out all like the skating. They built like this huge half pipe ramp in Germany or something <laughs> like that. And they were trying skating was so lame. Well, well, <laughs> rollerblading his... Wolfman. Yeah. Well, what was interesting is, is that they didn't want to use um, digital stuntmen in, in the movie um, because I think the Wachowskis, when they tried that with the matrix reloaded, oh, yeah. um, it, it looks just, terrible. Yeah. It looked really bad. So they wanted to have like the special effects look like have like the actual actors in them. So a lot of this stuff was like, you know, Channing Tatum and Mila Kunis against green screens. In fact, it took them like seven months to like shoot like all the, the, uh, 
kind of like background plates and she's, stuff. For I this. bet she's are really good at rollerblading now, though. <laughs> well, it was funny because Channing Tatum actually had never rollerbladed before um, uh, when he was cast. <laughs> they were like, can, can you can you skate on these things? And he's like, I don't know. I'll, I'll learn. <laughs> and, uh, Give me a couple weeks. Yeah. And, and uh, he was like really bad at it. Yeah, I bet. And so he was like, he, at, at some point he was just like, okay, I'm going to put these on at the start of my day and never take them off. And so like after a week of just like wearing them like 24 hours a day, he yeah, eventually learned how to how to yeah. rollerblade, but it, it was funny because like he never quite mastered like stopping. <laughs> so like uh, th- there are lots of bloopers where like he he just like, goes off the screen. Yeah, well, <laughs> well, like he, he misses his mark and like he'll because I mean he was doing some really complicated stuff like you know skating around having to like you know throw a punch and like turn on like yeah use you know, his little shield thing and then yeah. shoot and, and hang on to her the whole time. Yeah, yeah. so so like he was doing like he was you know, constantly missing like, you know, his marks and stuff. Okay. So besides like the awkwardness of a lot of the scenes, um, I, and I don't know, the acting was very like, like they didn't know what, I don't know. I felt like Mila, Mila Kunich didn't know what this movie was about. Well, she didn't. I, you're, you're, no one did. Here's what I noticed. <laughs> here's what I noticed on the rewatch of this movie. Rewatch? You've it, seen it before? Oh yeah. I watched it a couple times before. Time. It's literally like five different acts of, Channing Tatum's Wolf Boy rescuing Mila yeah. Kunis. Yeah, yeah. It's a total damsel in distress movie times five. Yeah, it's it's really is. It's it's like she's a dumb idiot and she keeps getting in situations yeah, where he has to go and rescue where he her. has to come rescue her on his fancy gravity rollerblades. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So okay, can I tell you guys a little bit about the, the the script to this movie? Oh boy, this sounds. Can we? Oh, you can. <laughs> <laughs> so the original script that the Wachowskis wrote was over six hundred pages long. And okay, well, how does that compare to us non-Hollywood people yes. to a normal script? So basically, the way a script work, works is that one page of script equates to one minute of screen time. So your average movie script is 120 pages. Okay. At most, 200 pages is pushing it. This was 600 pages. So they wrote four movies? Basically. And tried to squeeze it into one. But it, it was funny because like, when the actors were asked like what the movie's about. So like Channing Tatum did like a Q and a with fans on Reddit and, <laughs> and one of them asked them what the movie was about. And he was like, good question. I have the same question myself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. And uh, it, like I watched um, like a, a making of behind the scenes uh, on YouTube about this movie. And whenever they asked like the actors to describe the movie, uh, it was so funny because uh, Mila Kunis was on there and she was like, the script was very dense. And then Sean Bean was, uh, he was, he described the script as complex and he says, like, you're not going to get it the first time you read it. And it, it's kind of funny because like, if you, if you always look at bad movies, the people, when they talk about the script, they always talk about how like they couldn't understand it, but they they were sure it was brilliant. Yeah. Like if, if you look at. They try all, so hard not to talk shit about it. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, like That's if, their job. Like if, yeah. if you look at Ben Affleck and what he was talking about with Batman v Superman, he'd always talk about how like the, the concepts and the script were just like so complex that it took him a while to wrap his brain around it. And when, when I heard him say that, I was like, Oh, so the script didn't make any sense. <laughs> and it was, he's, he's an Oscar winning writer, right? For yeah. that, for Argo and other couple movies. Well, he, he got director for uh, Argo and he got screenplay for goodwill hunting. Okay. Um, but um, yeah, this movie uh, was a really poorly written movie. Uh, and the Wachowskis basically, they wanted to do their, a sci-fi version of the Odyssey, but they also incorporated elements of uh, the Wizard of Oz into it. And so their idea for Jupiter Jones, the main character, was like a Dorothy-like character who's just kind of a regular girl who's thrust into this fantastic situation, and she just kind of goes through it with her protector dog. <laughs> so oh. like, like, so they said that that Kane Wise, who, who's a... Uh, oh, I get it now. <laughs> Channing, Channing, Channing yeah. Tatum is Toto. Yeah, yeah. Ch- Ch- okay. Channing Tatum is Toto, and he's he's her loyal dog, who just her job his job is to protect her throughout the movie. There's so much wrong with this. Story. Jesus Christ! <laughs> so that infamous scene where she's like, where he's like, I have more in common with a dog than a human. And she's like, <laughs> I love dogs. I love dogs. Like, I always thought that that was like that was the scene. I've never seen this movie before, but I've heard people talk shit about that scene. And I'm like, yeah, that's a really bad line of you dialogue. Know, yeah. Immediately after that is like 
the the joke is that she knows it was a terrible thing to say. Like it was so stupid. And I'm like, well, that changes the context of it then. <laughs> because they're like to bang that dog. They're like self-aware yeah. at least. <laughs> And like, <laughs> do you think I have to get? I have to out? wrap my head around this whole thing because, like, like yeah, the whole movie he's talking about how he has all this in common with a dog, but like she falls in love with him, and like I asked Kadish at one point, and I'm like, I can't stop thinking about the fact that he's like a dog, but he's the he's the romantic interest in this movie, and I was like, you think he's got like a red rocket dick? That's or? what I was gonna say. Yeah, you think it like comes wow. out. Yeah, that's all I could think. I was like, that's a deal breaker. I think they didn't go far enough. I think he should have looked more like Barf from Spaceballs. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) And that would have been... I think that would have sold it more. Because the way he looks in the movie... They half-assed it. He looks like an elf. Either less or way more. Yeah, yeah. I'm saying full-on fur. He had a cool goatee. No, he didn't. He had a cool goatee. Not as cool as ours. And with (laughs) pointy like wolf ears. He had elf ears. Dude, this thing is like getting beyond control here. It's awesome, dude. Yeah. So, uh, fun fact, uh, Natalie Portman was originally supposed to star in this movie. I, I can, see, I can see that. Yeah. I, like, and then at, she, looked, she looked at the script and she was like, I'm not reading <laughs> <No>. that. <laughs> 600 I went pages. to Harvard. I'm not reading this bullshit. Well, during the wedding scene, um, Jude was like, is that Amadala? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It kind of looks like her. Uh, huh? Yeah, they kind of the did that. The wedding scene. It's like, yeah, where the guys I've never met mom. you before, but will you marry me, mom? <laughs> it's like, ew. Did you see the ring, so, though? I'd think about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, like, the concept of this movie, there's parts of this movie that I thought were really cool. Like the whole, the earth is just some farm. Dude, yeah. that, that concept is cool. Yeah. That right? hit me in, a, yeah. like, in that weird conspiracy bug. Because mm. I'm like, like mm-hmm. these people live for 90 eons, 90,000 years yeah. or more, and, you know, or, or in whatever, in it's like the idea, like we're gonna populate this planet with some some low lives. hybrid species, and we're gonna <laughs> let them let the planet come to get ripe over a hundred thousand years of development, and then when we figure it out that that, that they've used too much of the planet, that means it's time to harvest. So they go in there and they call the whole population and suck, this drug. suck their human essence Dude. out, so they can make everybody young again. That's that's pretty wild. That's that is, really some sci-fi stuff, right? there. It's sci-fi stuff, yeah. but like I said, the conspiracy. I don't know if you guys are familiar with like the whole conspiracy behind adrenochrome. You hear about that? It's basically it's some like it's some hormone that is extracted from people at the moment of like top fear, and it's supposed to be like just ripe for the taking at that moment of death and Sounds then they, they extract it and then like elites use it to keep themselves young which is like <laughs> some of the explanations for a while these hollywood elites are like 70 but they look like they're 45 mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's like it's some interesting you know interesting rabbit hole to go down but Save when that stuff for another when show. that when it's this movie I'm, I'm, t- I'm tying it back i'm tying it back when this movie kind of went down that same rabbit hole and i was like oh they're trying to tell us something <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I just, I found that to be the Wachowskis the, are in on it. Yeah, really. The Wachowskis are trying to warn us. Well, well considering what they're going through, uh, <laughs> they might need that. Type yeah, of, they were like, <laughs> this was like drug. the, uh, one of them was a brother and one of them was a sister. Well, during yeah, this well one, right? the mid transition. Yeah. Yeah. Like one of them was transitioning. One of them hadn't fully transitioned. So you can't call them the Wachowski sisters. You have to just call them the Wachowskis, I guess. That's fine. I don't we can't care. call them the sisters. I, well, I guess you could. I, uh-huh. I don't care. I, I don't think want, I, th- I don't want to talk about this. <laughs> I, I, I think they're just going by the Wachowskis. <laughs> That's but, fine. But uh, do you guys remember uh, when we did our time travel episode when we watched Twelve Monkeys? Yeah. And you guys ragged on Terry Gilliam for like you know, the Fish good, Islands, mm-hmm. good forty five minutes. <laughs> um, so I, think I said it twice. <laughs> so there's a there's a, a whole section of this movie that was inspired by Terry Gilliam's Brazil, where they're going through the bureaucracy to try to get her like officially certified yeah. as a royal. And Terry Gilliam is the final guy that they have to go is through. Is he the one oh, that they yeah. bribe? Yeah, he, he yeah. he's the guy who basically gives them the form like 27B slash 6 or whatever. <laughs> like that whole section where they, they're going through the bureaucracy and stuff like that was lifted directly from Brazil, uh, which was Terry Gilliam's like most influential movie. Huh. And so like the Wachowskis wanted to give him like a little homage during like in the middle of this film. So having never seen Brazil... When I watched that scene, I immediately thought of Fifth Element. It felt very Fifth Element y. Fifth to Element me. was very heavily influenced by Brazil. And I also, really, that makes sense. This is all tying together. And I also got a very like Parks and Rec vibe from it, too, because <laughs> I'm a big Parks and Rec fan. And, and that whole scene was like, um, yeah. That's, I don't think the Wachowskis 
were thinking of Parks and Rec when they heard that. <laughs> Probably not, but it's it's an interesting thing. But I, I, I just thought it was funny to <laughs> kind of see Terry Gilliam show up randomly in, in this movie. And, and the fact that they were paying homage to him as he was like in their movie uh, was interesting. But Matt it, had a nerdgasm. Yeah. It, it's also kind of emblematic of the bigger problem of this film is that it just it's so slow, boring, and disjointed. Like, uh, you know, Vader kind of talked about how um, the whole movie is just one scene of Jupiter having to be rescued after another. And um, uh, when you're writing a movie, you try want to try to stay away from having a very passive protagonist, like where the plot does stuff to the character as opposed to the character driving the plot forward through their actions and stuff. Like if you look at another Wachowski film, The Matrix, the first Matrix, Neo is quite passive up to about the... Like three quarters it, it, of the, the way. The yeah. end of the second act. And then in the third act, he becomes an active character. And that's when like the movie is really like, whoa, like, like, you know, stuff's happening. Yeah. So like Neo takes charge and he's the character who drives the action forward. But everything leading up to that point was setting the stage for that turn. It was like establishing like him, training him, stuff like that. And that type of thing is extremely, you know, uh, emblematic of a well-written movie. Whereas with this, uh, the the Jupiter character just stays passive the entire time, and she just goes from, you know, one set piece to another to another to another, and it's boring set pieces. It's like, oh, I'm going to go talk to this person now. Okay, <laughs> now I'm going to go talk to this person. Now I'm going to go through a bureaucracy to get a tattoo. Now I'm going to go talk to this person. Now I'm going to marry this person. You know, like she never actually took control of the movie. Everything was kind of done by the the Kane character. I even told Jude when we were watching it, um, I was like, you know, uh, Kane Y should really be the main character of this movie because he's the one driving all the action. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yep. He's the one who sets everything off. And I uh, would like to point out that Sean Bean did not die. Yeah. I was going to ask because I don't remember <laughs> yeah. if he died in the space like, battle or not. Well, I, I think the Wachowski specifically um, <laughs> didn't want had him to live. It's like, <laughs> Hey Sean, you want to live in this movie? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a thing too for him. Like yeah, I, even absolutely. there's a Netflix show called Frankenstein. I think that he's the star <laughs> yeah. of, and he even dies in his own show. Well, it's spoiler. Like, Jeez. <laughs> Sorry. It's been out for a while. Yeah. I tried watching that and couldn't get past it's not the first episode. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of rough. Uh, I also tried watching his show legend, um, which wasn't very good either. <laughs> um, but Jupiter Jones asks 105 questions in this movie. This was a fun fact where someone actually sat, sat there and counted how many times she asked a question in the film. <laughs> It was 105 questions. I don't know. I, that whole Wizard of Oz thing, and she kept saying, I just want to go home. I just yeah. want to go home. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. It does. Did you guys uh, spot Spratt from Downtown Abbey? No. Who's that? He He's the, the Dowager's butler. Spratt. Spratt. It's the best name in the whole show. I know. <laughs> and uh, he played the uh, the Armenian uncle, the one who's, who's like, how dare you... Try, tell to you sell, sell try to it. sell your cousin's eggs. Yeah. <laughs> Turn your cousin into a chicken. <laughs> <laughs> like he was the guy at the dinner table. He was yeah, giving her yeah. a hard time. Do you see Rav from uh, Avenue uh, 5? Avenue 5, yeah. She was in it. No. I, I, she, she, this, she, I don't I kind of like spaced out on this movie. I was, oh, oh, were she, you watching two things at once again? No, no. I, I gave my attention to this movie, but I was just like, what the fuck? <laughs> she was the the captain of the uh, Legionnaire ship. Oh, oh, that. Yeah, her. Okay, yeah. That's right. I yeah. do remember that. Anyway, I, I don't know, man. I just, this movie kind of just went by for me. It's it wasn't, very boring. It, it wasn't that's, interesting that's, enough to keep my attention. That's why it was a box office bomb. Yeah. yeah. Visually. Because everybody else felt the same way. Yeah, visually, it was fine. I yeah. was like, the CGI is all right for that year. I, I, you know, they spent their money on it. It came out okay. There well, was a lot that could have worked, but there was just so much that did. You could, you could tell like they the were romance. trying. You, yeah. <laughs> you could tell they were trying to set up like a. A franchise. A franchise here. Yeah. Yeah, like yeah, they, they, say, they, they really tried to do too much in this movie. They should have simplified it a little bit. With it being like originally a 600-page script, I just I pictured this being like a Lord of the Rings trilogy, and I was like, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> well, if it, if it had would been it, good, it would have been fine. But Would, yeah. the, would the roller spl- rollerblading wolf have worked if it was more like a like a skateboard or something or like a snowboard. I don't think so. I mean, no. I felt like the concept of him like flying around and having that extra upper hand as a mercenary. He should have just left his wings on him and let him, you know, fly, yeah. fly winged wolf. He was in some confined spaces. Though. I don't think he, the wings would have worked. Maybe a gravity surfboard. That's what I'm cooler. saying. Like a, bo- some no, kind kidding. of a board. I was kidding. Or something. I was kidding. Oh, like uh, like green goblin from Spider-Man. I don't know. I feel like that would have worked better. Who does everything outside. <laughs> yeah. 
I don't know, man. It was so, a weird concept. I feel like it should have worked. I'm not really so th- th- not really th- sure why it did. There are rumors about how um, studio interference kind of hurt this movie. Yeah. Oh, I can imagine. Because um, so they finished filming it in 2013, and they spent like a year on post production. And uh, you know, the film was released in 2015, but it was originally slated to be released in the summer of 2014. But uh, during the Sundance Film Festival that year, they did a secret screening. The studio did because they wanted to kind of get a sense of like, you know, what people thought of it. And it was the secret screening at Sundance was so disastrous. <laughs> like, like people when it like people got up and left during like this, like highly anticipated secret screening. And at the end of the, the movie, like normally like audiences at Sundance are very kind of respectful and they'll like clap or something like that. People just walked out <laughs> and every, every one of them, like when they were being exit polled, they, they were like, this movie was terrible. And so the studio got, um, kind of um, like cold feet. Do you know how long it was at the secret screen- screening? What do you mean? How long was the movie? Was it like way longer? Did uh, they no, chop I, it I, up? I, I think it was roughly the, the same. Okay. Uh, Just same curious. Amount of time. But anyway, so the studio basically decided to push back the release of the film from summer of 2014 to February of 2015. Oh, that's a dumping uh, ground. Turned and, it into yeah. a February movie. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, <laughs> the official reason for the delay was they wanted to give the Wachowskis more time to complete the over 2,000 special effects shots that are in the movie. Um, but they really mandated a number of reshoots to make the plot clearer because a lot of the audience said that they didn't understand what the movie was about. Um, so uh, the cost of the reshoots and the delay ballooned the final budget from its original $130 million to reportedly over $200 million. You know, I'll bet this movie would have at least broke even if it was released in the summer. People go to the movie in the summer just to go to the movie. Yeah. Well, they were worried about the bad word of mouth, like yeah. just tanking it. Yeah. So um, I can understand why they made the decision, but um, it'd be interesting to see what the original version of this movie was mm-hmm. compared to what we got. Because I can't imagine, like if they went back to reshoot stuff to make it clear, <laughs> it's still not very clear. <laughs> no, it's in, not. In this movie. I mean, when I if I look back and I try to think of what the plot was, it's it just seems like Mule, uh, Jupiter Jones is the, uh, the fish out of water, the everyday man who becomes the hero. She cleans kind of. toilets. She cleans toilets. She's Cinderella. Yeah, and uh, she has to stop this alien race from harvesting the Earth. Like that seems simple enough, but I think the problem is that, like you guys said, she's not really the main character that moves the plot forward. So like following her just kind of drags the movie down as opposed to if we were following Channing Tatum. I was also telling Jude last night. So like at the beginning of the movie, they're trying to kill Jupiter Jones. Right. And the reason they're trying to kill her is because Eddie Redmayne's character wants to basically stop her from like um, getting legitimized as his mother's reincarnation so that he can keep control of the earth. The minute that she is able to get kind of certified as a royal, um, he now legally has to get her to abdicate the earth to him through like a contract. And, uh, and so like he can't kill her. Otherwise, like if she dies, basically she can't like release her claim on, on the earth. So basically from that point on, he's trying to capture her. So he kidnaps her family in order to blackmail her into signing over the earth. But at that point, I, I'm like, you know, uh, it, it, like, couldn't he just, I don't know, kill her and then like... Very convoluted like, story. Like, yeah. yeah like, 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 maybe the tattoo quits working after the heart stops beating or something. I don't know. Or couldn't he just force her to like, you know, grab her arm and put her, put her over like that little thing and... I, I, or... And if he has doesn't... Has sensual. If he doesn't get <laughs> Earth, if she dies, how come he got Earth... When she died the first time. Well, because she wasn't legitimized as the queen. Yet. No, no, no. no. Well, I mean, when she was, because she's the well, reincarnation. Well, no, of her mother. will divided up her, um, her empire amongst her three children. Yeah. And so he got the earth in, in that will. Okay. Um, but in the will, it also stated that when she, if she were to be reincarnated, um, she gets control of the planet with which, on which she was born on, and that just happened to be Earth. Um, and unless you're paying very close attention to the movie, you're, you don't pick up on any of this. Okay. I did not pick up on that at all. 
I kind of yeah. did, but I but don't Also, care. I'm glad you brought up the will because that brings up another flaw in the storyline, which was the wedding. And he was like, if you marry me, then I'll be your heir. Why, why don't you no, just- No, she'll be his heir. Yeah, but like, why don't you just drop a will? Yeah. Why do you have to get married? I don't know. It just, it didn't make any kind of sense. Well, it made <laughs> sense from his perspective because if he married his mother incarnate- Also the, gross. And then killed her- the whole movie, she's like, I'm not your mother. I'm not your she's, she's, like, either, yeah. she's either trying to bang a dog or her son. <laughs> yeah. No, not his was, son. I don't think she was ever trying to bang her son. But but it, it's funny because like so if he married her and then killed her, he would inherit her, the earth through marriage. Mm-hmm. So like from his point of view, that made sense. From her point of view, she should have been like, uh, wait a minute. Yeah. <laughs> I think I think we're giving it way more thought than the Wachowskis did. Oh, I think they thought about this movie a lot. <laughs> I think they thought about the wrong parts of it. Yeah. <laughs> like the Wachowskis, you know, other than... Wouldn't it be wild? Other, other than <laughs> their first movie, Bound, and the first Matrix film, they're not very good at writing movies. No, they get too overly complicated. They get too philosophical, and they get too kind of caught up in the um, in the technical aspects of things. Like, y- you know the first um, big set piece in this movie where they're basically flying through Chicago, being chased by spaceships? I've watched that scene now, I guess maybe three or four times. And each time I'm like, this scene is so fast. I can't tell what's going on. Oh, yeah. It's all the action I, I, scenes it, in this like movie. Like it, it looked beautiful, but it was a mess. It was way too fast. Uh, it, they shot it specifically at the twilight hour in Chicago. So like every day they only had like 30 minutes to shoot in, in the city. <laughs> Because they had to shoot during that that period where the sun's rising and you get that nice blue haze in the background. And the city looks beautiful in it, but it's still too dark to tell what the heck is going on. Wouldn't you be able to fix that? And it, since most of the scene is going to be CGI anyway, you'd be able to kind of like brighten up the contrast a little bit? Well, but while, I, I, while still maintaining that kind of like I, hazy I, look? I mean, the, the look of the city is fine, but it's because it's still kind of like um, like dark. That and the action is so fast paced, and the ships are are kind of like reflective, so like yeah. they kind of blend in with the background. They got a chrome. Yeah, a lot of it just to, like you know it, it goes by too fast, and you can't tell what's going on for the most part. And it's a shame because the sequence itself, I think you know, it took them like fucking months to shoot that thing and and prepare for it and do every like they invented like this new technology of they call it like the roto cam or something like that, where they had like six different cameras mounted to a helicopter that was somehow able to give them a 180 degree uh, shot of like the city. And uh, so technically it was a very impressive scene, but visually it was just a mess because you couldn't follow the action. (sighs) Yeah. I don't know. Final thoughts on this movie, guys. Uh, Matt Vader, Jupiter ascending. What do you think? Yeah. Final thoughts. The turd. (laughs) (laughs) That's fair. Jude. Uh, to quote one of my favorite um, philosophers, One Star Crap Fest. Wow. <laughs> one star crap fest. I am a philosopher. Yeah. <laughs> deep, deep thoughts. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote one of my favorite philosophers, and it's uh, aggressively mediocre. <laughs> it, it was aggressively mediocre. The, uh, the biggest problem with this movie is that it was boring. Yeah. It was just a boring movie. All right. I can't believe all the... Uh, Truly harpies out there didn't scream because it's just a big damsel in distress movie over and over. Well, yeah. they, we, they didn't exist back then. <laughs> in 2015? Yeah, they, did. yeah, they, they did. certainly did. I don't know. I don't know. I don't care. <laughs> Whatever. Um, all right. Well, moving on. Uh, before we do, I wanted to remind all the listeners that you guys can check us out on the podcast platforms. Go to saltynerdpodcast.com, like and subscribe. Leave us a five-star review and then let us know that you did that and we will send you a little uh, gift in the mail, some stickers. Uh, so that's saltynerdpodcast.com. That takes you to whichever, um, either Google Play or iTunes or I, iPodcasts, and uh, you can leave us a review there. Let us know what you think of the show, and uh, then you can get us some swag for it. So thanks for supporting the show. Check us out. Um, moving on to my, this is my pick. Your pick. Yes, yeah, Sahara. I, I blame you for this. This is a great movie. Sahara, uh. Matthew McConaughey, and Penelope Cruz. And Jude, why don't you tell us uh, what the synopsis is and how much it didn't make? Okay. <laughs> Sahara. Um, it was released in 2005, I think. Yeah, 2005. It's two, two hours and four minutes. 
And here's the synopsis. Feel, feels like eight hours. Two hours and four <laughs> minutes of awesomeness. So, and just to um, backtrack, uh, Jupiter Ascending was two hours and seven minutes, I believe. Uh, okay, so the synopsis for Sahara. Master explorer Dirk Pitt goes on the adventure of a lifetime of seeking out a lost Civil War battleship known as the Ship of Death in the deserts of West Africa while helping a WHO doctor being hounded by a ruthless dictator. The budget for this movie was $160 million. Uh-huh. What do you think it grossed? That's all it was? That's mm-hmm. all it cost? Okay. Uh, if for it to be, a, I guess, like, I'll, I'll do $100 million again, right on the dot. Okay. Vader? One hundred. One million and one dollar. <laughs> He's price is writing it. <laughs> yes, he is. Uh, it grossed one hundred nineteen million. Okay, I considered went. among the biggest box office failures of all time. Its box office take amounted to barely half of its overall expenses. The film lost <clears throat> approximately one hundred and five million, according to a financial executive assigned to the movie. Wait, 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 wait. It. Cost a hundred and eighty million to make. One hundred and sixty. One hundred and sixty, and it made a hundred and nineteen. Nineteen, but they're saying it lost the company a hundred million dollars. Um, yeah, I think after marketing, uh, oh, the okay. film lost a, approximately one hundred and five million, according to a financial executive assigned to the movie. Meant to be the first in a franchise of oh, movies God. based on the Dirk Pitt character, but Dude. the franchise was shelved after the film's failure. At God, the give office. me that franchise. I okay. I'm just gonna say it. I freaking love this movie. Yeah, I think it was supposed to be like um, it, it came in after the, the after the Mummy, and the Mummy was just like such a successful franchise. I Wait, think that the Brendan Fraser Mummy. Yeah, this movie isn't that old, is it? Yeah. No, that, um, it came out in what two thousand five. Really? Yeah. Wow. It doesn't yeah, seem Mummy it came aged out, really well. Yeah, Mummy came out in the nineties. Mummy was nineteen ninety nine. Yeah, and just those like adventure in the desert movies. Yeah. I love it. I'm, I'm, I, I would have watched this whole franchise if they would have went forward well, it, with it. It's based on a series of books by author Clive Cussler. I'm going to buy those books now. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I just, I, I, I have a blast with this movie from start to finish. I love the character of Dirk. Uh, Matthew McConaughey, I think, is like the perfect casting for that type <laughs> of character. This like adventure-seeking treasure hunter guy who's like also some ex-military dude. Like, Perfect. Yeah, I, I think this was like the beginning of like like greasy Matthew McConaughey. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I also love him in uh, the other movie he did. Um, uh, what was it? Uh, Fool's Gold. I think okay, it's like yeah. a rom com type adventure movie. I think movie. that was after this. This is after. Okay, I, like anything in this era of Matthew McConaughey, I I love that character. That like beach bum, yeah. like Matthew McConaughey ripped, like going on adventures and stuff. I Fool's I have a Gold. blast. Yeah, Fool's Gold was night um, two thousand eight. Okay. Yeah, I just I, the the Civil War adventure of like trying to hunt down this like long lost Confederate ironclad battleship uh, that somehow made it across the Atlantic over to Africa. I'm like I'm sold. Like that sounds like fun. <laughs> yes, show me that adventure. And then on top of that, layered with this like this dictator, this uh, political espionage of like he's doing something that's causing a bunch of harm, and and you know we have to try and stop him before it gets globally it's just um everything about this movie just screams yeah that sounds like a ton of fun let me watch this movie i love the style i love william h macy rain williams his buddy steve zahn's the best part of this movie it's so much fun the humor is on point throughout the entire thing and i think that that lightheartedness also brings a lot to the to the table so i'm just like i love it man i had a super bummed that it bombed i am i didn't even know (laughs) to tell you the truth like i don't i don't I think I saw it in theaters. I probably saw it later on and I was like, wow, this is a great movie. Yeah, I, I think you found out when I was like reading the list of yeah. bombs and you were like, that bombed? Yeah. What the hell? I couldn't <laughs> believe it. I, I had so much fun with this movie. I thought for sure that it was like maybe not like a huge hit, but I thought like at least people would enjoy the movie. Well, see, here's the problem with it, Alex. This movie was designed for you and you're just one in a million. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I usually like these types of movies too, like the desert adventure type films. Uh, I went and saw this movie in the theater when it first came out, and I fell asleep in the theater <laughs> because How? it was so boring. There's no point in this. And movie then I rewatched it for this podcast, and I fell asleep again. <laughs> I had to rewatch it a third time. He to did. Get I came home stuff last night. And he was rewatching it. And I was like, "What's up?" I, I fell asleep through. <laughs> I fell asleep Be- because it, it's it's one of the most boring action movies. Like, there's just nothing at stake in, in this film. Like, stuff just happens in this movie. And there's actually a very interesting story behind the making of this film. 
Um, you love your behind uh, the scenes. Before, before we get to, to that, why it, it, it became the dud that it did. Before we get to that, let's get <laughs> Vader's thoughts on this movie. Why did you? Why did this you was? Not? It took me two sittings to get through this movie. Really? Aww. Yeah. Oh my gosh! It's, it's 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 just it's boring. There's just the story is it's kind it's convoluted. of convoluted and a little overcomplicated. Oh, there's I there's too many weird characters in it, and it's just like one really bad action sequence after another. It's 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 not good, dude. Oh, I, I completely disagree. I, I you know just because you want to grow up and be Matthew McConaughey. <laughs> it's a. Uh, uh, no, it, it was bad. I didn't like the characters. I thought the lady girl, what's her name? Um, Penelope, Penelope Cruz. Cruz. Yeah, I thought she was miscast. Really? Yeah, there's something about her I don't like. The sidekick guy. So that's the word plague. I love her accent. No, I, just, I don't like, I don't like her. Talk all day. They're, they're, the they're, sidekick <laughs> dude didn't do anything for Al? me. No. Oh, he's so much fun. You know, I like Matthew I like McConaughey. Al. I really do. I like I like him a lot. Yeah. And and but this movie, he's not Harrison Ford. You think Aww. Harrison Ford should have been this? Cast this in this, this movie? is like. Uh, Something you know, I would have seen. I could see Brendan Fraser in this role. No, Matthew yeah. McConaughey. Um, so I really, mean, just, really campaigned for this role. Like he wanted to do this this character, and so like he he tracked down all the producers, and he was like, "Man, cast me, cast me. I want to do this. Movie. Yeah, I want to do this movie." I think. I mean, I think I think it could have had some potential, but you know, once they got into the you know the the the, the secret solar plantation and 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 stuff, it just. It just kind of went off well, the rails. There are actually two subplots in this movie that yeah. got cut out from the book that um, would have made it even worse. <laughs> you you wanted to say something, Jude, before he gets off? Because well, we're, yeah, we're going to let him go. I gave you the this. synopsis, but I didn't tell you what I thought of oh, it. Oh, okay, go ahead. Yeah. Um, what did you think about so this So I didn't hate this movie. Oh, thank um, you. I like all of the people in it. I like Penelope Cruz. I like Matthew McConaughey. I love um, Steve Zahn. I love William H. Macy. Um, I just, I, I didn't hate it, but... It wasn't very memorable for me. And the one thing that I really, I get really irritated with, with movies is when they shoehorn a romance and at the end that they didn't really build up. So like at the end, they're like making out on the beach. And I was just like, where did this love story come from? That's that like once they hung out with each other when they were traveling through the desert and it was like, they're on the boat, not much privacy, close quarters. They started to like each other. And then that invite when they're getting ready to part ways, he's like, Hey, I know somebody who has a house on you know, the bay that they never stay to because they're work like that little banter back and forth was kind of like that first invitation of like, we kind of like saved her life like three or four times. Yeah. Like, Hey, there's something here we, we can work with. And then late, it gets paid off. In I the don't end. know. Maybe I fell asleep, but I totally <laughs> missed the build up of that. But it, it's, it's funny because Matthew McConaughey and Penelope Cruz, is that her name? Oh. Yeah. Uh, they actually uh, started a fling on set during this movie and they ended up dating for like a year afterwards. Do you remember when Penelope Cruz and Tom Cruise were dating and people lost their minds over Cruise and Cruise? <laughs> no, <laughs> I don't actually. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Uh, all right. So Kadish, why don't you take it away? What's, what's the behind the scenes on this? All right. So do, do you guys know, uh, are you familiar at all with the author Clive Cussler? No, no I had no idea this was a book. Yeah. I'm so, legit going to go buy it now. <laughs> so, uh, uh, unfortunately he passed away, uh, not too long ago, but he was a very prolific kind COVID. of, Kind of, no, <laughs> he was a very prolific kind of uh, you know adventure uh, book author, and, and his character Dirk Pitt had something like twenty thirty novels, something like that. Wow, uh, it was a bestseller, and uh, he had optioned one of his books. I think it was the first Dirk Pitt novel. It was called uh, Titanic Rising or R Raise the Titanic or something like that, and uh, it was made in I want to say like the early eighties or something along those lines. And he had a terrible experience on it. The movie ended up bombing. And so he was very kind of like down on Hollywood. And he's like, I'm not selling any more movie rights to my books. Mm -hmm. So wait, so this is a movie that's out there that we could watch. Yeah. What's it called? Raise the Titanic, I think. Um, but uh, yeah, Raise the Titanic 1980. So uh, basically Clive Kessler, after that debacle, refused to sell the movie rights to any of his books. And um, then he was approached by a... Uh, like billionaire um, who was like from the oil and gas industry and he had bought um, a stake in Regal Theater Chains and he decided that he wanted to make uh, movies for, you know, his theater chain that were kind of like uh, kind of Christian, you know, like uh, they, they had like, um, you know, Values. Value, yeah, yeah. They, they, they promoted like called? certain morals. Things, yeah. <laughs> What's that thing where you're like good? Yeah. So his, his name was, was Philip Anschultz. And uh, he basically 
uh, got into like the Clive Cussler books and he's like, you know, we could turn this into like an Indiana Jones type thing, yeah. like a big franchise. Yeah. And so he, he went to Clive Cussler and he was like, Hey, you know, I really want to, you know, turn your books into movies. And Clive Cussler was like, no, go pound sand. I, <laughs> I, I, I don't want this. And the guy was like, I'll give you $10 million a book. And Clive Cussler was like, well, okay, <laughs> huh, let's talk. Yeah. And, and so like basically, uh, so this guy, um, Anschwitz, uh, he was new to the whole producing thing. And in his negotiations with Cussler, he agreed to give Clive Cussler a creative control over the movie um, because uh, Cussler didn't want his books mismanaged again right. like, like it had been before. Okay. And so this was a very unusual thing where basically he, he got final say on the script and uh, who was cast and who the director was and all this other stuff. And this ended up being the worst mistake that um, the guy, the financier could have made because apparently Clive Cluster was a real jerk. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so they went through like a couple different directors who just couldn't work with this guy because he kept like, you know, yucking their yum, uh, poo-pooing their ideas. Sounds like something you would this, do. This movie had 10 different screenwriters wow. on it who, who came in wrote the script, Clive Cluster came in and said, you guys are all hacks. <laughs> He'd rewrite the script, and then the producers would be like, it's even worse now that he rewrote it. Mm -hmm. um, and eventually, uh, the guy who came on to direct it, his name's Breck Eisner, he was the son of Michael Eisner, who ran Disney from the 80s all through the early 2000s. So he was the son of the most powerful guy in Hollywood who came on board, and he had never directed a big budget feature film before, like before, wow. before this, he had done some commercials and he had done like a couple episodes of, of TV shows and that was it. So like, this was like his first movie. He did surprisingly good. <laughs> uh, that, <laughs> I, I, I guess given the circumstances, um, but so C Cussler uh, decided he was going to write his own draft of the script and he basically clashed with every sc um, screenwriter that the um, executives brought on to polish it. And uh, basically, like, he'd call them hacks, and then the screeners would be like, well, you're a hack. You're a bigger <laughs> hack. So, like, it was a very contentious working uh, relationship. Um, and uh, the producer of the film even said that uh, Breck Eisner was kind of like a spoiled brat and having to deal with him. So there was, like, a lot of, like, kind of catfighting going on behind the scenes. Huh. And it got to the point where they were like, okay, let Clive Cussler put what he wants in the script, and we're just not going to shoot it. We just need to get the script approved. <laughs> So eventually they get to the point where, you know, they're making the movie and Cussler's kind of like, you know, he's not on set, so he's not seeing anything that's being done. They're just like shooting the movie as is. And then like once he finds out that they kind of like lied to him, uh, during his um, book tour, his next book tour, he starts blasting the film. He starts talking about how it's going to be terrible, how it's not faithful to the book. He's telling his fans not to go see the movie. Oh, wow. And, uh, Never mind, I'm not going to buy his book anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and then like before the movie was released, he, he filed a lawsuit against uh, the, the, the company that made the movie uh -huh. um, saying that, you know, accusing them of fraud and all this other stuff. And um, then the production company countersued him <laughs> for specifically trying to tank the movie by refusing to do publicity for it and then bad-mouthing it. Yeah, I'm sure he signed a contract that said he was supposed to do both of those things. Uh, I don't know about that, but they basically said that him bad-mouthing the movie hurt you know, the box office for the film and, um, and that he was actively sabotaging it. Like he had tried to blackmail them by using his creative control um, clause <laughs> um, and a bunch of other stuff. Yeah. So um, basically um, during the course of this lawsuit – the line item budget for the movie was entered into evidence and it got leaked to the Los Angeles Times and the Los Angeles Times published everything that was in the budget. And this was the first time that a lot of people got to see kind of like what goes into uh, these bloated over a hundred million dollar budgets in, um, in uh, you know, these Hollywood films. And if you go through the budget, there's some really interesting stuff in there. Like they actually budgeted bribes for Moroccan officials <laughs> um, in order to like shoot there. Um, but they had stuff like uh, um, like Matthew McConaughey's, um, in addition to the money he got paid to do this movie, which I believe was like $8 million or something like that. He, uh, he also got a, uh, like a bonus of like a million dollars for like incidentals which went towards like travel for his entourage and like a bunch <laughs> of other stuff. 
And so like when, when you wonder why these, but why these movies cost so much and you look at like all the expenses on this thing, like, you know, like his colorist, uh, Timothy Zahn uh, or Steve Zahn um, had like it um, written into the budget, like a nanny for his kids and like a bunch of other stuff. Like you can easily see like where all this money goes and, and how like frivolous a lot of the spending is like Matthew McConaughey had, a, had, had it in the budget, uh, a gym for his hotel room. Oh well, yeah. Yeah. I don't see why that's a big deal. He's got to stay, wo- you know, swole for this yeah. sheen. I mean, he's yeah. like shirtless for yeah. half this movie. And like then Steve Zahn's nanny needed new tits because who wants to look at <laughs> flat chested nannies? But, but, it, but it, Steve Zahn is, is Al? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. But it was also interesting um, to see like certain things like, for instance, the casting of Penelope Cruz where we talked about how you know, Vader doesn't like her. Felt that she was miscast. Clive Klessler um, wrote the character in the book with actress Selma Hayek in mind. And so he really wanted Selma Hayek to be cast. But the problem was, is that the producers... It's it's too bad Zendaya wasn't around. (laughs) (laughs) But the producers, in order to get a tax credit from in shooting in Spain for like $23 million, they had to cast a Spanish actress. So they cast Penelope Cruz specifically because she was Spanish so they could get that tax credit. And, uh, (laughs) and, uh, And so like, uh, you know, these are some of the things that the inside baseball things when you're making a movie... Like, uh, for instance, there was a lot of product placement in Sahara. And, uh, like, there was a scene where, like, their Jeep got stuck in, like, some type of, like, I don't know, sand hole or something. And uh, the producer's like, no, no, you can't shoot that scene. And they're like, why not? And they're like, because Jeep is a product placement, and they wouldn't like it. If they showed their they truck show their tr- stuck. Jeeps don't get stuck. stuck. Yeah, Jeeps exactly. don't get stuck. Exactly. You have a Jeep. I do. <laughs> so, <laughs> so like, it's a lot of things like that where, like, you know, there are these product placement considerations that they have to take into account that affect the actual creative aspect of the movie. Like the gum and Time Cop? Exactly, yeah. <laughs> this scene brought to you by Pepsi. <laughs> <laughs> That's nothing new. That's so, like, no. Truman Show. Yeah. Like, look what I got at the store today. <laughs> and if you see anything that has, like, a perfectly placed label, it's not by accident. And, and here's a funny th- uh, thing is that the... Um, the character of Al was originally supposed to be played by Jack Black. Huh. And no. uh, yeah, it, but see, but, that, I would have liked that. Really? <laughs> no, dude, but, I think, but Jack Black was like, wait, I have to spend three months in the desert. Hell nah. Nah. Uh-huh. Dude, I think, I think uh, Steve Zahn nailed it. I love Al. He's one of my favorite characters in the movie. And then I, Jack, I like Steve Zahn. Jack lot. Black later went on to do Jumanji. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which is fine. But yeah, I just spent, in, in, which spent had, months in the jungle. Like, <laughs> <laughs> probably on set jungle. Now, if The I'll Rock think. had made this movie with Jack Black, it would have been <gasps> awesome. <laughs> with the same plot and everything yeah. that you guys just complained yeah. about? This would have been way better. You guys are such hacks. Been way better. <laughs> You're such hacks. Get out of here. But, it's The Rock. But you, know what, <laughs> you know what's funny? is like There are like 350 special effect shots in this movie. <clears throat> Could you even tell? No. But uh, that's a good thing, though. The helicopter I mean, blowing like, up? When, that, when the special effects blend in so well that you can't tell it's a special effect, like that, that means they did their job. Did you, did Every you... time they showed a gold coin. <laughs> <laughs> but there was, there was actually, there were two subplots in this movie that were in the book. And one of them was about this kind of Amelia Earhart type person who was trying to break some aviation record and she ends up crashing in the desert, which is that plane that they found. Oh. And they actually shot the sequence. It cost them $2 million to shoot this plane crash sequence, and they ended up cutting it out of the movie. I want to see the director's cut of this movie now. Um, and then uh, another subplot from the book, and this is a crazy one, is that at the beginning of the movie, when, when you see the, the, the Texas, which is the ironclad ship yeah. that, the, that the Confederacy had stolen, um, in the book, uh, they kidnap Abraham Lincoln and they're holding him hostage on the on the boat. Oh, okay, in the past. Like, yeah. What? <laughs> <laughs> and so they escape with Abraham Lincoln, and in order to cover up the fact that he was kidnapped, they hire an actor to play him and then assassinate that actor. So everyone thinks Abraham Lincoln's dead. And then in the in the movie, they they include this subplot because Clive Cluster, like, you know, insisted it be in the movie. Okay. Um, and in the end, when they find the ironclad ship in the desert. Um, they were supposed to find Abraham Lincoln's mummified body in there. Okay. They completely See, I, cut that out. Of I the feel movie. like that would have been that would have been overcomplicated because that has no bearing on on the actual like the point of the movie. Still, would have been cool. Yeah, sure. I was I was waiting for Sloth to show up hat? at the end of the movie in, in the Texas when they were <laughs> hey, shooting shooting cannons and helicopters. <laughs> 
I don't know, man. I just I'll, before I forget too, I just wanted to say that the music is on point in this movie too. Oh, that, there was all, music. Seventies like, rock soundtrack is. I didn't, I didn't even know. Phenomenal! Notice. It's awesome. All the best music. The best music ever you know, recorded is in this movie. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Like whenever Matthew McConaughey is like drinking like tequila or whatever. Yeah. So like in movies, they usually replace the alcohol with like apple juice or something like that because they don't want the actors getting lit. And he like would secretly swap out like real tequila. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, so, like, so, like, so like every scene where they're drinking tequila, like he's My actually like, drinking. I love it. I love it. Okay. Yeah. And, Final, uh, oh, you got more? Jesus. Well, <laughs> well I mean, uh, there was a funny there was a funny story about Rain Wilson on this where so do you guys remember the scene where he, like he's having to like sneak out? Yeah, he's on the goats. Yeah, he's in he, the back he, of the truck. Yeah, he's in the back of the truck with uh, the goats, and uh, <laughs> so basically, um, like when he's escaping the border guards like the, the truck would have to like stop and he'd have to like pop his head up. And so the camera could see him and he'd have to like duck back down as the yeah. camera drives away. Like apparently every time um, the truck stopped, the goats would get scared. <laughs> and when they got scared, they would pee. <laughs> and so let's do that. And so they yeah. had to do like eight takes. And by the end of it, he was just like, wallowing in goat urine Yuck. and and is that yeah. why he smells when he gets back to the ship <laughs> and, and <laughs> william h macy is like what is that smell <laughs> i guess but but he was quoted as saying like i didn't understand how much goats urinate <laughs> and th th this was before like the the office had come out and stuff like that so no one really knew who rain wilson was i think he got paid like thirty four thousand dollars for this movie um but um he like like you know, him being stuck in the back of this truck with all these goats and just like having to like sit in their pee yeah. for like, eight, you know, like entire day of shooting. <laughs> uh, I just thought it was kind of a funny story. All right. Final thoughts in this movie. I unashamed. I love this movie. I, I love the plot. I love the historical aspect of it. Everything. I love the camaraderie between uh, Matthew McConaughey and Steve Zahn. It, it just, I'm sold. I, I have so much fun when I watch this movie. It's, it never gets old for me. But that's my final thoughts. I know you guys don't agree, but that's me. So, Vader, final thoughts on Sahara? <laughs> <laughs> I don't he's have just any. shaking his head. Just, <laughs> he's just looking it's, at Alex like he can't just, believe it's him. It's just a wannabe. <laughs> it's a wannabe it's what? A, it's a wannabe Indiana adventure Jones. movie. Yeah. Okay. Not my thing. Yeah. All right. Indiana Jones with any of the spectacular elements to it. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't have any supernatural thing going on. I really, I really like the part where they shot the hel helicopter out of the air with the 200-year-old king. 150. Whatever. Stupid. <laughs> <laughs> what if it blows up? Well, at least we went down for it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's... No. Pass. Uh, hard, right. hard pass. Jude? Um, like I said, I don't hate it, but it's not really memorable for me. I never have to watch it again, but I have no ill will towards it. Hmm. Yeah, the cardinal sin of this movie is that it's boring it's it's a boring action movie because because there, there's there's nothing at like set pieces happen where like these big action scenes happen but like there's nothing really at stake on them so like you don't you're not invested you don't care and for me like i like i said this was like the i watched this movie three or four times now and each time i fell asleep during it and i don't usually <laughs> fall asleep during movies um but you, you know didn't for, you fall asleep during godzilla yeah yeah. Okay. So you I did, but follow. but like I had seen Godzilla all the way through before. So there's a movie another, that, another terrible movie you like. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. There's a there's a uh, when I watched Twelve Monkeys, just talking about falling asleep. I did. I, I I rented it on Amazon and I fell asleep halfway through, and then my rental expired. And I had to rent it again. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> to watch it. <laughs> so I feel your pain. Kate. Yeah, but I, I mean, like the cardinal sin of both Jupiter Ascending and um and Sahara is that. They were boring. Like you just didn't care when the action happened. The action was well shot and looked really good, but it just there was no emotion attached to it. So it wasn't exciting. It was just kind of something that happened. Yeah. And and like the characters, like the plot was so convoluted, you didn't really know what was going on, so you didn't care. And the bad guy wasn't very well established. I mean, it was just there was a lot of stuff. Like if it had just been Matthew McConaughey and Steve Zahn like doing like a buddy, buddy copping. Buddy copping. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if they had, if it had just been like their chemistry together, like going throughout the movie, like that would have been on a treasure hunt. Yeah. That would have been a fun movie, but this movie, unfortunately, like it had a lot of elements to it that could have been good, but it ultimately just fell short and was just very boring. Mm. Yeah, I agree. Well, they, I mean, if they had just like gone and looked for the ship in the middle of the desert with some traps and some adventures and stuff, that'd been fine. But they go into the, 
the nuclear waste dump and, plague, and, and, and yeah. the, all this other stuff. It's the just plague. like, forget the plague. it. Which, which is threatening the entire world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Like, like the, the red algae that, uh, that the underground um, toxins are creating, we're going to bloom as soon as they hit the ocean. And within six months, all the oxygen that the ocean created would have been consumed by the algae and the earth would have died. They didn't do anything to fix the stuff flowing in underground water. They didn't fix anything. Well, they found out about it, and then they were going to well, fix yeah, it. Well, yeah, okay. <laughs> Luckily, <laughs> problem solved. If we yeah. stop it Man, now, we none know of this all about. We knew all. Yeah. We know all about this COVID. There's a little thing. bit of a hole there. Yeah. <laughs> There's a little bit of a anyway. COVID's a joke. Anyway, <laughs> There's a little bit of a hole there. We're like, okay, so if it's in the river already too late it's not yeah, it's, it's, kinda, it's too late but I, I get what you're saying but i just it was for me it was forgivable because it was just part of the action gave you, the stakes to the are movie. you guys ready to move on to the biggest box office flop of all time <sighs> i can't wait to talk about this movie before we do before we do we're going to remind our patrons, our patrons, our listeners, that they can go to saltynerdstore.com. That takes you straight over to our T Public account because we just moved. We used to be Teespring. Now we moved over to T Public because they have more options and they have a better. I feel like they have a better system for uh, for buying some merchandise. So uh, you can Get go your there. Get shit quicker. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, this is also true. Um, they don't come from uh, they don't come from China. So bingo. Um, you guys can go to saltynerdstore.com. If you are a longtime listener of the podcast, you'll get some of the inside jokes that we have. We have some shirts there. Uh, I specifically made for Jude a... We senior. Oh, we senior. That's on the list. I'm kind of slow. I'm making more merch. I'm a little... I'm trying to... The learning curve for doing like Photoshop and stuff is uh, longer for me, but <laughs> I'll get there eventually. Slow is the We right have word. like His Name is Horace t-shirt. We've got Scream Queen, original Scream Queen t-shirt. We've got some Jurassic Park stuff. Are you ever going to make a shirt for me? Yes. It's all about Jude right now. <laughs> I want my 80s Ladies first. shirt. I'm, I'm going to, it's, uh, it's there. It's ready to go. I'm, I just have to click <laughs> the, so excited. Click the button. Anyway, saltynerdstore.com. <laughs> 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 go there and check out some of our stuff, support the podcast and get some cool merch in return. All right. All right. Jude. Yep. This is your pick. I know. You made us watch this <laughs> it movie. Was, I was rough for me too. <laughs> I hate you. Listen, we chose... Box office bombs, big budget. And you can't box office you can't bombs. Talk about and this was the biggest one. Yeah. Not a I've movie. Ne- I'd never seen this movie before, but I think we we all n- know the heard about it. The yeah, the it's, urban legend of Gili. Yeah. So okay, I'll give you the Why don't you synopsis. Tell us about this movie. All right, Gili uh, came out in two thousand three. Uh, is two hours and one minute long, I believe. The synopsis is Larry Gili is assigned by a crime boss to kidnap the brother of a prominent district attorney. A beautiful woman known only as Ricky is sent to stay with him to make sure he doesn't mess up the job. Um, so before I get into the budget, it became the first film in history to sweep the top five categories at the Razzies. Like it's the goat. It got all yeah. five yeah. of the major categories. Worst picture, worst actor, worst actress, worst director, and worst screenplay. The budget was seventy five point six million. What do you think it made? Seventy five million dollars? Uh huh. It made thirty eight million. Later? One dollar. <laughs> 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 Budget of seventy five point six million. It grossed seven point two million. And I win the game. Yeah. Yep. Worldwide. Worldwide. World. Oh my yeah. god. Well, I gave it four dollars this week. <laughs> <laughs> Lopez and Affleck each got twelve million to star in the film. Yeah, their combined salary was more than the movie made. <laughs> I lucked out on that one. I, I'm gonna. I'm gonna tell you guys what I was thinking and then I had a revelation after I was done watching the movie I was in the shower getting ready for bed and I was like you know you what's, thought about this movie in the shower I did yeah. you know what's weird Alex is like you actually liked all these bombs <laughs> <laughs> what was the first one Jupiter I didn't like Jupiter setting okay you like two out of the three bombs yeah no I I, I wouldn't say I like this movie that's I'm gonna get crucified if, I, if that <laughs> goes out in public I don't like this movie but I, I uh, he's gonna go into his but I appreciate it no no <laughs> But that's some good moments. <laughs> no, 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 no. I found this. I don't know if it was just the mood I was in or whatever, but I was watching this movie, and it's got to be one of the most unintentionally funny movies I've ever seen. Every scene is so 
awkward and <laughs> weird and borderline like kind of offensive. A uncomfortable watch. Uncomfortable. But the lines, if you're watching it, like <laughs> Dicosaurus Rex, are you kidding me? There's a line where put the clam liquor on the phone. <laughs> the <clam. laughs> Jesus. There's lines in this movie where I was like, oh my God, I can't believe they just said that. That's fucking hilarious. <laughs> and after I got you mess with the bull, you're going to get the, the horns. The whole scene, the whole scene, he's in the shower and he's trying to amp himself up so he can go and screw this <laughs> lesbian. <laughs> Or he doesn't know. He doesn't know yet. And then he comes out in his silk robe and he just like takes it off like he's in a commercial. It looks like you. Like there's a, I just thought, I I pictured him picturing himself walking out like on the cover of a Harley Quinn romance novel with like a fan blowing at him. He's not even ripped. He's got like a dad bod. Oh, he's got the worst tattoos. He's, He's flexing inside the mirror. I was dying laughing at this movie. I and thought then, that was the most cringeworthy scene. In it's so cringe. It's so uncomfortable. It's so cringe. Okay, Did so you say cringe? Cringe. Sure, cringe, whatever. I don't care. And it, <laughs> That's what the other guy would have said. Yeah. It's so cringe. It's so cringe. <laughs> What's the matter so with cringe. you? <laughs> Baywatch. Baywatch. God damn It's it. a cringe, Lowey. It's so cringe, Lowey. <laughs> You, it, you know that, what was the other cringiest scene was when the mom started talking to oh her God. lesbian experiences. You know, you know, I wasn't always Larry's mom. Uh-huh. <laughs> and, like, then, oh my God. and then once she finds out that Jennifer Lopez is a lesbian, she makes it a point to kiss her on the mouth. Yeah. Uh. She, she's giving her like the bedroom and, eyes. And like when you first see the mom, she's wearing a thong. Yes. Uh. A pink and, thong. And she's all like fat and old. <laughs> I love it, dude. Well, she's it's actually so probably more like our age. Oh, uh, man. <laughs> anyway, so um, the the revelation that I had after Found I was old. this movie was just in my brain, and I'm like, why was it so funny? Like this movie was so unintentionally funny, and I realized this is a Will Ferrell movie. Picture Will Ferrell instead of Ben Affleck with all the Will Ferrellness that he has, and it becomes so much funnier. Can you not? Can, is that just me? That's just you. God damn it, man. I can't. Yeah, no, I Will can't. Fa- like, I can't wrap my head around that. So picture him saying some of these lines about like, the you know, the bull and the cow and he's mooing in, in the bedroom while after yeah, he has. Yeah, then but it's, then it's an actual satire movie. Yes, this exactly. Satire. Exactly. If, if they make this a satire movie with Will Ferrell, it's just, I don't know. To me, I was like, that, that would have been like a, almost like a Talladega Nights, like over the top comedy movie. Here's how I would have changed it. I would have swapped Ben Affleck with Christopher Walken. Dude, the cameos in this movie, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was like, is that Al Pacino? Al Pacino? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What? what? Yeah, for sure. So for, for, you obviously don't know, but um, Martin Brest was the writer and director of this movie. And he is the Oscar-nominated writer and director of Scent of a Woman with which uh, is where Al Pacino yeah. won an Oscar. became Al Pacino. Yeah. yeah. But, but like Martin Brest, like he was a very famous director. He had done Beverly Hills Cop, Midnight Run, Scent of a Woman, Meet Joe Black. So like he had like this big pedigree of, of like movies that were award winners and box office hits and had done really well. And he uh, wrote and directed this movie and this is the last movie he ever made. This movie ruined his career. Um, Rightfully so. Yeah. Um, But, uh, you know, it's actually kind of interesting because the way that this movie panned out, the Breast's original version of it was actually much more of a mafia-focused kind of um, story. Yeah, this movie doesn't know what it is. It's not a mafia movie. It's not a romantic comedy. The reason is because it got reshot by the studio. And so this is what happened. So basically, um, Jennifer Lopez and Ben Affleck met on the set of this movie. Originally, Halle Berry was supposed to play the Ricky role, but she dropped out because apparently the script was bad. <laughs> but but uh, they cast Gen- they cast Jennifer Lopez. And then she went to Catwoman, <laughs> and Jennifer Lopez um, had uh, just gotten married like a couple months before the start of this movie. Yeah, this was when she was married to her backup dancer, right? Yes, yes, Chris Judd, and so basically, um, she was married at the time. She met. Ben Affleck on this set. They started a fling together. Um, and then she divorced Chris Judd after nine months of marriage in mm-hmm. order to, to be with Affleck. And so the romance between JLo and Affleck kind of um, got a lot of publicity for this movie. And uh, in fact, like right after this, she did the 
music video for Jenny on the Block and had Affleck in it as like you know her like boy toy, and and so like at at this time the media kind of just pounced on this relationship. They called them Benefer. Mm-hmm. It was the first the first time that they'd actually like like jammed up uh, like a celebrity couple's name. I was under the impression that Sorry. they were already a couple, and then this movie no kind of happened. No, that was oh, okay. that was jo- Jersey Girl. Um, so basically, uh, she divorces her husband to be with Ben Affleck and then they get like engaged, like immediately, you know, almost immediately yeah, like in November of 2002. It was a giant pink ring. I remember it. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, so Lopez and Affleck begin filming Josie girl together. And, uh, so Geely is kind of set to come out kind of at the height of the frenzy surrounding their relationship. And they do like these test screenings where the movie is completely different from the movie we got. And it, and it does not go well. Basically uh, there's a whole different ending where it's revealed that Jennifer Lopez's character, Ricky, uh, AKA Rochelle, like she was actually not a real contractor. It was her girlfriend, the one who shows up and slits her wrist, who was the, um, like the, (laughs) that came out of nowhere, the the mafia lady. Well, apparently it was set up better in the first incarnation of this movie but um their relationship was on the rocks and so rochelle wanted to know more about what her girlfriend robin's life was like so she intercepted this job from uh lewis that larry Larry? Larry. oh no no the the mob boss is okay lewis Lewis, yeah she intercepted this job from lewis and so she goes to geely's apartment to pretend to be her girlfriend and basically uh that's why she always kind of gets out of situations by talking her way out of them in the movie. Like she never actually like beats anyone up because she's not actually trained to like do any of that stuff. And after um, Lewis gets killed by Al Pacino's character, um, Strickman, I think that's his name. Uh, she realizes that it's like too real. And so she confesses to Gigli that, you know, she's not who she says she was and stuff like that. And so she leaves, like she, she like basically gets out of town and Geely um, decides that, you know, um, he wants to kind of turn uh, Stuckman in for, or Strickman in for killing Lewis. So he goes to Christopher Walken's character to hand over Brian and Christopher Walken turns out to be a dirty cop who's working for Al Pacino's character and he tries to kill both Brian and Geely, and Geely ends up killing Christopher Walken's character, but he takes a bullet to the gut in the process. And so he drives, like he, he's driving away with Brian to try to get him to safety, and as they're driving, they come across the Baywatch shoot on the beach, and so um, Brian starts freaking out, saying Baywatch, Baywatch, so Geely pulls over, and he sends Brian into the, the you know Baywatch shoot, and he sits on the beach and he basically just dies while he's looking at the waves of the beach as Brian kind of gets his, his happy, his happy place. That's you know, a dark movie. Yeah. It's, it's a, it was a very different, like a lot more serious, that's a lot a more mob, of, yeah, of that's a, mob a mob movie. movie. And the studio um, was looking at the test screening results and they were seeing that they weren't good. And so they were like, you know what? We need to cash in on the Ben Affleck, Jennifer Aniston Jennifer like, Lopez. craze. Lopez. We're going to turn this into a romantic comedy. And Martin Brest was like, no, absolutely not. So he <laughs> fought with the, the studio on this. And the studio basically went in and re-edited the movie and made it into a rom-com. Yeah. Is that when they incorporated a romance between these two characters? I think that that romance was always kind of there. Okay. Just wasn't um, so... But but like the happy ending of her coming back and picking it up and them driving away, like that was not originally in the script. Yeah, the whole, like when I was watching this movie the whole time, I was like, this movie's really confused as of what it's trying to be. Like at times, it's trying to be like a dark mobster. Uh, I just I just I spent so I just spent most of the time wondering if it was a appropriate for me to laugh at things. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's funny. You remember it's like, the, oh, the the handicapped guys making some funny noises, dude. When they were in the it's morgue, like, yeah, and he starts beatboxing to <laughs> great. Baby got back. Yeah, I was dying as, laughing as, oh, yeah. as he's sawing off a hand with a plastic, yes. uh, with yeah. a yeah. plastic knife. knife. Like, I, like Jude was like, a plastic knife, really? How does that even work? <laughs> I was no, like. I, I was like waiting for it to not work. I was like, no. It's going to break or something. No. Like these really? are the these no. are the Will Ferrell moments. This is the Will Ferrell moment. My, my right? wife and I both decided that this the Brian character You made was, your wife watch this? Yeah, I, I owe her a foot rub now. <laughs> <laughs> and uh 
<laughs> we both decided that Brian was the best character in the movie. Okay. Yeah. And that we want to see more of his stuff. Yeah. You, so. you like how his Tourette's just kind of disappeared midway through the film. I would yeah. watch a series of just Brian. Yeah, for sure. That's, yeah. that's the a name franchise. of the show. Brian. Yeah. Just Brian. Just Brian. Just Brian. <laughs> hey, do you guys remember when the movie turned into the vagina monologues? Yes. <laughs> Gosh, man. That was, like, there's a whole scene which, where... Oh, is that where she's like stretching? Yeah, she's or stretching. She's doing yoga. And you're yeah. like... It was like a full five-minute scene of yeah. just J-Lo talking about her cooch. In her camel toe. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, whoa. And how superior it is <laughs> to yeah. the male organ. Yeah, right, right after Affleck got done with a monologue talking about how great dick is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you guys, this is a freaking Will Ferrell But, but the, the, the best part, so like we've already kind of talked about this, was when he was in the bathroom. Because so like he invites uh, the Ricky character, Jennifer Lopez, to instead of sleeping on the floor because Brian's got the couch, uh, she's welcome to share his bed. Strictly <laughs> professional, of course. And she's like, okay, I'll take you up on that. So she's in bed reading a book. And he's in the bathroom. He thinks he's going to get laid. And, and he has this whole kind of like Pep super talk. cringe scene. And I feel like most of it was ad-libbed. <laughs> Probably. And But he's got this whole like... Um, he thinks he's so intimidating too. Well, well before this happened... He had, this is like typical New Jersey. Like, yeah. He, yeah. He, had, he had this whole monologue about how there are only two types of people in relationships. Bulls and cows. <laughs> And I, I forget how it goes. Jude, do you remember? There's a bull and a cow in every relationship. Yeah. So it's not two types of relationships. It's just like two types of people in every relationship. One person has to be the bull and one person has to be the cow. Yeah. So the, the dominant and the submissive. Right. And he's in the bathroom and he's like flexing his muscles and he, he, he's like, yeah, I'm the bull. You're the bull. You mess with the bull, you're going to get the horn. <laughs> <laughs> you want this horn? I'm yeah. going to give it to you. Yeah. Give yeah. me this horn. It was, it was so cringy. <laughs> uh, so bad. Stick so this bad. horn right in It was in equally you. as bad as her like poetry about her vagina. Like I was just, I'm like, my God. And then you see like the faces that Ben Affleck was making while she was saying that. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, Oh, this is weird. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it, it was some of the worst acting I've ever seen. I don't yeah. think they were acting. I think that was just them like, no, but like his reaction to stuff, like oh, like, they, yeah. like they they keep showing reaction shots of Ben Affleck throughout the movie, and it, it's almost like like you know um, like acting class level yeah. bad, where, yeah. where you know it's like now look surprised, you know, like now look like whoa, that was interesting. I wonder, I wonder how many scenes it took him to to film that scene. How many the takes? vagina scene? Yeah, mm. I think it was I, all ad libbed. I mean, Do you think they, she just knew both, all that? They both, that, that's a conversation they had earlier that day. <laughs> that's they were what like, sold them. Here's what we're going to do. <laughs> oh, I don't think it would, I think it would have been better if it had been ad-libbed because it just was so cringy. How many yeah. times have you ever confused a vagina for a mouth? Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's the sister organ. Of the mouth. Yeah. <laughs> so, this is so like weird. all the time. It's like, just um, like. Speaking into a vagina, being like, oh, God, I'm sorry. But, but it was funny. There was a certain point in this movie where Jude turned to me and she's like, oh, my God, is he going to convert her? Is he going to turn her not gay? Yeah. yeah. I, I said, is he going to cure her gayness? And Matt just like looked at me and just kind of like yeah. gave me a slow nod. And I was like, oh, fuck. Why did I pick this movie? But it's funny. This is actually the second movie Ben Affleck has had sex with a lesbian. Yeah, that's true. Chasing Amy was the first. Uh -huh. I just, I don't know. So he, Can we stop making movies where you cure gayness, please? <laughs> please. Is that a thing? Well, they, they did kind of set it up with the mom scene where, where she was, was like, so forced. she was like, you've been with boys before, haven't you? <laughs> and Jennifer Lopez is just kind of like, yeah. Uh, and, I can't but, tell you how many times I've had this conversation with your mother. No. <laughs> this movie is so Tell me awkward. about all your sexual partners. Now let me kiss you on the mouth. And, and then um, like in the scene where they actually do have sex, where she's like, She's like, you know, turkey time. And he's like, Ugh. what? Gobble, She's gobble, like, gobble, gobble. gobble. Yeah. <laughs> Give me some of that hetero head. Uh, That's yeah. gross. Especially after like he, he made a big deal of saying like, like he was really good at it. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I'm really good at getting head. <laughs> yeah. You'll see. <laughs> a hot tub time machine reference there. Yeah. But, 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 and it turns out that Jennifer Lopez's character is the bull in the relationship and yeah. he's the cow. And he kind of realizes that, and he's just kind of like, oh. And then he moves. Yeah, he moves. He Ugh, moves after so sex. Bad. That's a scene yeah. in this movie. I'm telling you guys, this if they would have just went full over-the-top comedy and, like, Will Ferrellized this whole thing, it, it might have been salvageable. Well, that's why this movie sucks, because yeah, it didn't. It didn't. It was like, no, we're going to be a mobster movie for 15 minutes, and then we're going to be a comedy, and then we're going to be a romantic, a romantic movie for another, like, 
spot here and there. It was just, it was so weird. And Ben Affleck's like mobster gangster character was so wishy-washy. I didn't understand why Lewis needed him at, at all. I don't know either. The whole time he's like, well, sorry, he, Lewis. I guess sorry. Lewis was kind of like a mess up and he was the only guy that, you know, Lewis really had to you know send out on jobs and stuff. <laughs> um, but um, I actually, there were two scenes in this movie I thought were pretty good. And that was when... <laughs> So Gili doesn't have any books in his house, <laughs> and um, Brian before he goes like before he goes to bed, he keeps asking Gili to read to him. He's like, "Read to me, Larry," and uh, and so like you know, uh, Ben Affleck has to find stuff to read to him. So he just picks up random stuff like a Tabasco bottle, and he starts reading him like the the little thing on the label. And Brian's <laughs> like, "That was really good, Larry. Thank you." <laughs> in the second scene, he's like reading uh, a, a Charmin, a Charmin uh, <laughs> roll. Uh, you don't have any books. <laughs> oh, that's pretty funny. And the, and I like laugh, she man. had a book, she could have just picked up her book. Yeah, she could have lent him the book. Yeah, um, but also. Uh, I thought the best scene in the film was Christopher Walken's little cameo. <laughs> <laughs> so he comes in, he's and he's he's full Walken, yeah. Right? Like he's just oh, yeah. it, like like his voice Walken. is going on all these different pitches. Walken Prime. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, you know what I want to do right now? I want to go to Marie Callender's. I want to get a piece of cake with a bunch of ice cream. I want to put it on your head, <laughs> so your tongue can slap you in the face as you're licking it. <laughs> And it's just like, what is this dialogue? <laughs> <laughs> and then Walken, as he's leaving, he just, he, just like, <laughs> he just stops and looks at Ben Affleck for like a good, a, so a good 10 seconds of, of him just like giving him this weird Walken stare. And then without saying another word, he just turns around and leaves. <laughs> It's the best scene in the this film. Is so weird. Never, never shows up. <laughs> never again. shows up. Yeah, like, they, they didn't even say his name. You don't even know the name of the character. It's like uh, they got they got walking and uh, Al Pacino. And I'm on the phone. It's like, hey, I need you guys to come in for an afternoon so we can put an extra 15 minutes in this movie. That's exactly. What it is. I'll give you, you guys, ten million dollars. You, you don't have to 15 act. 15 minutes of your time. You don't have to act. Just be yourselves. <laughs> say whatever your you want. Yeah. Just yeah. come in. Say whatever you want. We're gonna film it. Ooh ah. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Shoot you with the gun. Yeah. Uh, boom. And okay. Al Pacino has this weird ponytail. Oh yeah. my god. Yeah. In oh. his disheveled suit. You make me come down here to this place. I don't know where I am, and I'm gonna take care of business and stuff and <laughs> shoots and yeah, it's silly. Yeah. But but the walk-in scene was so much better than the Pacino scene. <gasps> just because yeah. it was so weird. And like Sixty uh, percent of this movie takes place in Geely's apartment. Yeah, it's yeah. like crummy Hollywood apartment. And it's like so bland. It al- it's almost like a stage play because it's all just dialogue about stuff you don't care anything about. And Ben Affleck's character is so terrible to Brian through like ninety percent of this movie. Yeah, the justification for him being like, "Hey, man, I'm real sorry about," uh... and he can't like look at like that was the worst acting in the whole thing is when he's trying to apologize to him for being a jackass. And he's just like can't look can't look at him. He's just looking around. He, I'm real. I'm real. Um, you know, I'm real sorry about. Uh, I can't say who it I am because I'm too macho. <laughs> I can't. I was just like, oh my god, dude. yeah, that was bad. Yeah, yeah. But um, it's funny because in addition to holding the record for sweeping the Golden Raspberry Awards, this movie also holds the record for the largest drop off in ticket sales after the opening weekend. Ooh. <laughs> after you opening weekend, Jedi, yeah, I was just saying that was last last Jedi. after opening weekend it fell eighty two percent. And what happened was because of all the bad word of mouth and stuff like that, Columbia Pictures actually pulled all the advertising for the film because of the terrible reviews. So basically they kind of, it was a self-fulfilling prophecy type thing where they didn't want to keep throwing good money after bad. So basically they stopped advertising it. I think it came out in like over like, like 2000 screens, something like that. So, um, it was just like, uh, um, everything was working against this film. Yeah. And in, in fact, it's kind of funny because uh, Matt Damon has been quoted as saying that <laughs> every time you mention Geely, uh, Ben Affleck has like a visible twitch uh, that like, like he almost like, um, what do you call it, uh, flinches whenever you, you say the name Geely. <laughs> and Kevin Smith has said that um, like whenever him and Ben Affleck are playfully ribbing one another, Smith only has to say uh, Geely at the end of the conversation. <laughs> So, so, so like, it's kind of like Vader's boobs where like they're talking. It's yeah. like, so like, it's like, okay, I'll see you tomorrow. Okay. Geely. <laughs> <laughs> so like, um, but yeah, this film, like, I don't think people understand just how bad it, it truly is. Like, <sighs> like it's just everything about it, the acting, the direction, the writing, the dialogue, 
um, e- even like Brian's performance, it, you, you know, they like, focus like, on it way too much. Like, like you know how in Tropic Thunder they they have that line. That's uh, I was that was my final when we were going to go around for final thoughts. I was going to be like, yeah. Tropic Thunder was right. Yeah, Tropic Thunder was right. Or you they, like, never, like they, they went full in this they movie. They went full, and it was a mistake. Yeah, that was my yeah. that's my final thoughts. Uh, Vader, what about you? What are your final thoughts on? Zili rhymes with really. I'm ashamed that you guys can't say the word retard. <laughs> <laughs> it's a no no word it's now. It's not. It's just whatever. As long as you don't say it with malice. <laughs> I guess I don't care. <laughs> whatever. Brian was fun. I liked him. I like laughing at him. It was good acting performance. So, yeah, the rest of the movie is terrible. Okay. Terrible Bay- movie. Baywatch. I'm glad we watched it. The- Can we go to Baywatch? <laughs> Two that's hours. Where, that's where the sex is. That's where the sex is. You're telling me. My you penis sneezed. <laughs> I, thought the, uh, okay. I forgot about that part. Oh, and then that's the part good. where Ben Affleck goes, God bless you, penis. <laughs> After they had sex. Uh, Did he say that? Yeah. Oh my God, really? Uh-huh. They're laying in bed together, snuggling, and he goes, God bless you, penis. And she's like, what? He's like, nothing. Oh my I mean, it just me- means that he came. Oh my God. Just make it a joke. My final thought, um, I could sit there and watch J-Lo stretch out for a while. <laughs> That's no problem. But uh, the rest of the movie is terrible. Okay. One star crap fest for sure. <laughs> J-Lo, J-Lo looked good in this movie. She did. She, did. she yeah. still looks good. Yeah. She's great looking. She's, she's an attractive woman. <laughs> Jude, final thoughts on uh, J-Lo. A-Rod's a lucky guy. Rhymes with really. I'm really sorry, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Our top patron, Haas, was like, I'm pulling my money from you. <laughs> Awesome, sorry. You better apologize. No more rom coms. <laughs> gonna put it on your head so your tongue can slap you in the face as you lick it. I'll send you a pie, Haas. I'm really sorry. Oh Go to Marie Callender's. It cost seventy five dollars to get all silly. I shipped him a t shirt once and it cost me seventy five dollars. Oh god. It's like wow. Yeah, he was only a dollar patron. Yeah. <laughs> See what I do for you. This is how much I love you guys. All right, <laughs> Kadesh, final thoughts on... Uh, uh, I can see why this ended the career of a Oscar-nominated writer-director. It was a very bad movie. Terribly cast, terribly acted, terribly directed, terribly written. Everything about this movie is bad. Yeah. All right. Well, sorry about that, guys. Next time. <laughs> next week, we're going to have some better movies next week. Speaking of <laughs> next week, uh, we're doing a new thing now. We're going to let you guys know ahead of time what the theme... We're going to try to. Try to. If we Subject remember. to change. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, so starting off in August, which is uh, Jude's birthday month, Yay! and she got to pick two weeks out of that <clears> month. <throat> and what are your two subjects that you pick? Just the subjects, not the movies. Vampires and sharks. That's right, everybody. August, August bites. bites. We're going to be talking about all things that bite in August, uh, starting with vampires in the first week. And uh, if you are a Patreon, you will get exclusive access to which movies we've picked uh, for next week. So uh, go ahead and jump in there. Give us a dollar and you get access to a ton of extra content. Uh, that's saltynerdclub.com and help support a great podcast with a bunch of friends talking about movies. All right. Before we leave, going around the table, Matt Vader, where can they find you on the socials? At Matt Vader 74 Twitch, Twitter, Insta. Yahoo. Or not, no, not Yahoo. Yahoo. YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> YouTube. Friendster. <laughs> yeah. people My on my space. <laughs> Jude, where can they find you? At I am Jude Juju on the socials. Right on. And they can yell at you for making us all watch Geely. I said I'm sorry. Rhymes with really. Matt, uh, Matthew Kadish, where can they find you? At Matthew Kadish on Twitter and KadishBooks.com. And I'd also like to point out that if you want to join our newsletter, mm. You can do so at salty at uh, what is it? Saltylist.com. Salty list. Salty nerd list. No, it's salty, salty it's list. Salty list. Yeah, saltylist.com. Okay. And <laughs> sign up for our newsletter to get information on when new merch goes up on the store and when new episodes go up and all types of fun stuff. Cool. All right, everybody. Thanks for listening. Have a great night.